you know, this is kind of fucked up that that's happening because even in response in the last couple of weeks, you've seen, you know, Kotaku and Verge and all these articles of from traditional mainstream media uh, come out and they're all saying the same thing. They're all admitting the same facts and, it, and it, they're all coming out a couple days apart just to kind of keep the conversation alive. We've seen the, the there's been a number of different um, approaches to this, specifically on Steam. Uh, people have been looking at uh, potential games that Sweet Baby is involved in. And to the point to where the games that they are currently involved in, they are scrubbing references to Sweet Baby because they're seen as radioactive right now. And there's a new game coming out called Unknown Nine Awakenings. And there's a Steam community there that they're scrubbing anybody that goes in, deleting anybody that goes in and, and even references Sweet Baby Inc. Right. Yeah. And so even if you say like, I can't wait for this game to come out. It has Sweet Baby Inc. involved, right? They, they'll still scrub you from that, right? Yep. Um, and that's that's kind of kind of insane to think about. Uh, but the the point is, is that this unknown nine game actually has ties to it. The two co-founders of Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, are directly a part of the development of this game, the main narrative and uh, the main marketing of the game. So Vera Dark is a YouTube YouTuber, and uh, she's been talking about this quite at length. And uh, she took a look at this um, the Steam community page for Unknown Nine Awakening, and uh, put this tweet out yesterday. I thought this was quite interesting. It says uh, on Unknown Nine's Awakening Steam community hub, they're trying to sanitize it, but the backlash has been insane. While they've tried to ban users who want to talk about Sweet Baby Inc.'s involvement, they also allow content like this. Okay, this is uh, SBI haters are obsessed. Stay mad. Imagine letting a consulting firm live rent free in your head. You can stay mad and complaining about an imaginary enemy. I'm 100% buying this game. Edit. I made a lot of chuds mad. Pro tip get a girlfriend and do something useful with your life. Also, turfs and transphobes deserve death. <laughs> Oh, let's go ahead. You know, we can't reference the company, but let's go ahead and laugh some death threats. Let's go ahead and leave that happy little nugget right there. Yep. It's uh, it's quite interesting that they'll just leave that there. Yeah. Some people would never have standards without double standards. That's just how that works. It's just, uh, well, and then that's that's the most fascinating thing about this. You know, and and I saw your video. We talked about this briefly at the start of the show, man. Your your latest rant that went up uh, just, you know, what, an hour or so ago before, before the show, you fucking nailed it. And we talked Gamergate very briefly on a past show. I, I'm pretty sure we have. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you've been on this. You've been on this long before Gamergate was a thing in 2014. You pointed this out in your video. You were talking about kind of the, the lack of, of ethics and gaming media, and, you know, years, literally years before. Yeah, like um, 20, 2012 or something like that, that I started that series, maybe even 2011, I can't remember. But yeah, do I did a series called Downfall of Gaming Journalism, where I, I would literally pick a publication every video, and I would just go down their list of crimes, essentially, <laughs> right? So I did, I did IGN, I did uh, Game Informer Magazine, I get... Half of, I mean, really the proof is in the pudding. Was Gamergate successful? Well, half of the publications that I covered in the downfall of gaming journalism series no longer exist, right? <laughs> so right. was it successful? I dare say yes. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of got on that early. And then Gamergate happened, like, I don't know, two years later. And it was wild because it was like, whoa, everyone else just kind of woke up to this problem. And not that nobody else noticed that gaming journalism was utter crap for years and years and years. It clearly it was evident when you could go on IGN and read a review of Mass Effect 2. And in the margins are Mass Effect 2 ads. And there's a giant pre-roll Mass Effect 2 ad that if you hover over it, it will unfurl across the entire page and cover your whole screen. And then along the bottom of the page is a Mass Effect 2, you know, competition or whatever. Like, dude, of course the gaming journalism field is utterly ridiculous. We had, uh, and by the way, you could, you could and probably should resurrect that show. <laughs> Because, yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah. Of course, the problem is there's a dwindling number of subjects because 
God, who's left? Kotaku? I already did a video on Kotaku long, long, long ago. Um, oh. There's very few left. I guess the big one that I need to touch on is Polygon. I never did one on Polygon, and they are pretty atrocious. You could you could literally do an you don't have to cover the entire the entire thing. You could just cover an individual article every single week. Like I'm telling oh. you, there's there's enough there uh to where <laughs> the, the nonsense, just whether it's Kotaku or Polygon or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, we had we had Grums on. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with with Grums. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. Great. So we had Grums on a couple days ago, and uh, I was on with him on uh, Tuesday night's main event last night. And he was talking about this, uh, the, the, how back in the day, how they would really bend the knee to, to journalists. Like they would go out of their way to make sure that journalists were, were catered to. Uh, they would really, uh, really spend all their marketing money on traditional media, on traditional websites. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like IGN, like, as you mentioned, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, a, a giant campaign with traditional ads and such and how that shifted over the last, you know, really, really 10, 10 years, 15 years, really since Gamergate happened. And that's what I feel that a lot of this comes back to is, is the power has shifted so dramatically, so dramatically that, um, once again, these are not journalists. Like you can't call yourself a journalist if you're, if you're actively omitting facts from, yeah. From things you you are an activist at that point yeah well and, and when you caught everyone in that in a bunch of private not just one but a bunch of private chats basically coordinating articles saying oh we, we're all going to talk about how gamers are over we're all going to talk about this harassment campaign uh that we see and people you know prominent names jim sterling a bunch of people who were working at major gaming websites were all Caught in 4K on those forums, coordinating their stories and whatnot. Whoever did that legwork, <laughs> seriously, right. is a is a golden god. Because you knew that it was happening, but you finally had evidence that it was happening. You know, you, you yes, hundred percent. And you wonder if that's going to happen again. If someone inside this little club is going to break or have some sort of clear conscious conscious oh. and, and be like, you know, this is kind of fucked up that that's happening because even in response in the last couple of weeks, you've seen, you know, Kotaku and verge and all these articles of from traditional mainstream media, uh, come out and they're all saying the same thing. They're all emitting the same facts and it, and it, they're all coming out a couple days apart just to kind of keep the conversation alive. It does seem definitely coordinated. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, that happens in mainstream journalism. Have you ever seen that, um, compilation of the, uh, news reporters and a lot of these are local news reports where they're all reading the same statement basically about yeah. covid or whatever it is Th- that happens in mainstream journalism why wouldn't it happen in gaming journalism gaming journalist websites are usually owned by the same parent companies that mainstream journalistic endeavors are so <laughs> it stands to reason they would follow the same <clears throat> dearth of eth- of ethics you know the um the crazy thing about this, it, well, it, the the reality of this for a lot of people, specifically from the from the journalist perspective, is that they're hanging on because they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. Yeah. Once they're done being a journalist, they'll just go into PR or something. They'll be they're going to leverage their friends inside the industry. Right. But or a lot work. of the, or a lot of them are retreating to YouTube. Some of the more bought out ones you're seeing, they're they're now opening. YouTube channels. I won't right. name names. You all know who they are, but they're all they're all kind of retreating as the as the ship sinks. You're seeing a lot of former IGN people starting YouTube channels. Right. Of course. But and, and that's the thing is, will they be successful? Because that's my that's my thoughts on this is that if you're really good at what you do, you'll be able to swim on YouTube yeah. because it is a giant ocean of content. And if you can make it on YouTube, then then you're good. If not, you know, then, then you were a hack at what you did, you know? Um, yes, there's a game when it came to, uh, there's a game when it comes to YouTube and you have to play that game and I get it. Right. But just like there is in, in video game journalism and such, but yeah. Um, yeah, man. So anyway, uh, please, have you been to IGN games is about the only thing that's not on that website. 
Well, it's like, hey, yeah. our favorite Game of Thrones characters. Like, that's <laughs> every article for Christ. Yeah, I literally I, just read an article from IGN this morning about the Acolyte, and they were talking, they were praising The Last Jedi in that article, and I was yeah. like, exit. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped reading it. I was like, okay, no, no. Yeah. Uh, IGN is where I go for all my outdated TV news. Mm. Speaking Craig's of, like, uh, I like The Last Jedi. <laughs> Was that, was that the one said, where? Was that the one with the red sand? Yeah, he said that to me. I have it in writing. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't. I don't care enough to not like it. How's that? How was that? Is that good? I, I don't no. know. I don't know the characters or care enough. You, about ignorance right. is bliss. It's fine. I get it. Cool. Yeah, right. I don't. What do you want from me? Right. Lord, IPs. Culture yourself, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, <laughs> Harry Potter, anything. God. Luke, I, I, here's how bad it is. Luke Skywalker dies by turning into a fart. That's... Yes. He does. Yeah, does he? He does do that, doesn't he? He, he just kind of like disappears into into mist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just. 